We've got a handout tonight for our Bible study. Uh, I feel like for 50 years I've been trying to teach through this Sermon on the Mount, uh, but I've been going at a snail's pace. But some of you have indicated that you kind of like it when I do that stuff, so tonight we're going to do that again. Uh, <clears throat> I, I want to say a very quick word before we actually d- dive into this. Uh, A word of encouragement uh, about our preschool that's coming together. Uh, We have applicants now, children, uh, whose parents want them to come here. Uh, I know that most of y'all in this church, probably every one of y'all, have bought stuff to put in the shoeboxes. Mr. Brother Graham's shoeboxes, right? And feels good to do that, doesn't it? And y'all have watched the movies, have you not, where the kids in some country way over yonder opened up the box and you saw the delight on their faces? Have y'all seen those? Okay, all right. So, so and that's wonderful, and I'm glad you do that. I mean, I think it's wonderful for us to reach out to children around the world and bring some measure of joy to them at the same time telling them about Jesus. And we do a lot of other good stuff. This church belongs to the Southern Baptist Convention. And when you put money in the plate and pay your tithes, part of that money goes to the cooperative program that funds the missionaries overseas that we support. And they win little boys and girls to Jesus. And uh, one of these nights, I'll tell you a few of my stories when I went to Nigeria and had the privilege to teach over there. Uh, So my whole point I'm making is we do a lot to reach children around the world. And it it is important that we reach children here in our own neighborhood. And so one of the ways that we are attempting to do that is through that preschool. And and, uh, that's a fantastic ministry. And so therefore we will be obeying God's word, Jesus' words, when he said, you will be my witnesses first at home. Well, he didn't say home. He said Jerusalem, but that was his home, wasn't it? <laughs> so, <laughs> so we start in here, and we go out in concentric circles, and I, I'm proud of you all for doing that. Anyway, pat on the back. Let's move on. Okay, so the Lord's Prayer Oh, man, <clears throat> the Lord's Prayer. I hope and pray that some of you have learned something about the prayer that makes it more intimate for you and that when you pray it, you have a deeper sense of what you are saying. And tonight, I think I'm going to, if we can, if I can get through my time here and don't chase too many rabbits, I think you will find the end of this prayer is one of the most provocative things that you've heard in the Word of God. So, <clears throat> this is the prayer. I printed it as um, Barclay uh, uh, interpreted, and it's been on every printed thing that I've given you for our Bible study. So, I'm just going to read that as he, as he interpreted the prayer. So then, pray in this way. Our Father in heaven, let your name be held holy. So I'm asking right now, I'm asking the Holy Spirit to remind you of what you have heard and read and listened to as we've worked through these various terms, the name Father, Heaven, what about God's name and how holy it is. Remember our studies and let your kingdom come. And I try to remind us all the time that I want us talking about the kingdom of God uh, more so than anything else. And And Jesus' prayer invites us to get God's kingdom here just the way it is in heaven. And the only way we can do that is you and I practice our Christianity in such a way that wherever we are, we bring that part of heaven to here on earth and bring his kingdom here. Let your will be done as in heaven, so upon earth. Give us today bread for the coming day. And I beat that one pretty good. Tonight, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. That's the verse I want to focus on. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. 
So in order to understand this part of the prayer, we got to have a real solid sense and understand this word sin. What does the word sin mean to you personally, to all of us? We should really know something about sin because the book says that there is none righteous, no, not even one. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The book over and over again reminds us that there's only been one perfect man ever, and that was Jesus. We are not perfect. And so uh, sometimes human beings tend to gloss over sin. There was an old uh, psychiatrist that I studied under when I was in school. I'm trying to think of his name, and I can't. But anyway, he wrote a book with a title. The title of his book was, Whatever Happened to Sin? And then he used all those names that people call stuff, you know, that's actually sin. And and whatever happened to sin? And he, a psychiatrist, was chiding the moral leaders in the churches and the denominations about using all of those uh, other words instead of calling sin, sin. And he he said that was a whole lot what was wrong with mankind and why he had such a solid practice in psychiatry because people sinned too much. And he knew it was a sin issue uh, uh, instead of a psychiatric issue. All right, so we got to understand the word sin. Here in the Deep South, particularly in the Southern Baptist Convention, and I have said this repeatedly when I make criticism of the Southern Baptist Convention, I'm doing it as one of you. I mean, I, I am one, so therefore I'm part of the family. I feel like I can offer constructive criticism to the family. But we in the Southern Baptist Convention for uh, a long number of years now have tended to think about sin in terms of pietistic stuff, piety. You know, we, we don't smoke and we don't chew. We don't go with the girls that do. We you know, we, 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 we look at alcohol and uh, tobacco and cursing and uh, fooling around, those kind of things. And of course, and of course you can, you, I, I, I can't justify tobacco in any sense uh, because it's a destructive thing uh, to mankind. Uh, I'm perhaps not as harsh on the alcohol part because there, right there in the book, Brother Paul told us that if we got some stomach problems, we ought to take a little bit of wine for it. He he warned us not to take too much, but he did say a little bit, so I have to at least acknowledge that the word is there. Uh, But we Baptists have been, tried to be teetotalers and then the problem with that is that we condemn everybody else that does have a drink, and we think that we're better than they are. And that's what I mean by piety. And yet, I remember old Carlisle Marnie talking about a woman in church, you know, when he was preaching about sin one time, he talked about tobacco, and she's, she said, I never have had a piece of tobacco touch my lips in any way. He got on alcohol. I've never had a drop of alcohol on my lips at all, you know, and Everything he talked about, she never had any any of that kind of sin. And then Marnie in his lecture talked about, but she was a member of his church. And if you want to talk about a gossiping tongue, she had one that made the rounds every day in the town. And, and you know, she, she would not have a colored person on her property and so forth and so on. So sin is what we make of it sometimes, but... I, I don't have very much tolerance myself for the pietistic part of Southern Baptist. I think we ought to call sin sin when we see it, and I'm going to talk about it tonight, and I'm going to call some of it sin tonight. So, here in the New Testament are five words to describe sin. In the Greek of the New Testament, the first word, and the one used most often in the New Testament, the most prolific word, is harmatia. I have already introduced you to that word several times, harmatia. It describes the archer who is putting an arrow on his bow, and he's looking out yonder to bullseye target, and he's trying with all of his might to send that arrow straight to the bullseye. 
but no matter how hard he tries, something happens. Either his eye is off a little bit, or his hand quivers a little bit, or a puff of wind comes up. Something happens, and his arrow does not hit the bullseye. It flies off to the side, and that's known in the, in the biblical world as missing the mark. That's a person who really, really tries to do what is right, but he doesn't quite reach perfection. He misses the mark. That's the word harmatia. This sin, then, is the failure to reach the potential that God has given to us. This sin is the failure to reach the potential that God has given to us. In John's Gospel, chapter 1, in that beautiful prologue to John's Gospel, John says, To many as believed, he, that is God, gave them the power to become the sons of God. Man, that's our potential. And how many of us can say that we have reached that potential 100%? Um, th this missing the Mark business, for me personally, this is the one that has weighed most heavily on me because I feel like that God gave me a lot of potential and I feel like that I wasted a lot of years uh, in my younger days doing what a lot of young men do and, and uh, to the point of being alcoholic and smoking and all that stuff and cussing and running around. I, I, I wasted so many valuable years and it weighs on me that I can't recover those years. Now, God is a very parsimonious God. I hope you know that word, stingy. He doesn't waste anything. God doesn't waste anything. So even in those years that I wasted, God has been able to use that in my life because when I talk to an alcoholic or one of those people that's now living like I used to, I can talk the language, and I'll tell them, you can't fool me. You can fool somebody, and you can't fool me. The guy tells me, well, preacher, yeah, I, you know, uh, I, I probably drank six beers, you know. I said, <laughs> I said, how many times have I said that? What you're trying to tell me is you drank a, 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 a suitcase, right, 24, and then you went and got another one, right? And his wife is over there going, yeah, 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 you know what I mean? No, Bubba, don't, don't try to blow smoke. I mean, you know, sin is sin. And missing the mark, not reaching our potential, is one of the things that weighs heavy on me. <clears throat> so, missing the mark. Which one of us, here's how Barclay describes these three phases of hormatia. Number one, you look at that young boy right there. He will do something. And then a few years later, you look at that young man. He could do something if only he would. And then on down the line in his life, look at that old man. He could have accomplished so much if he just would have. He will, he could, he should have. That's harmatia, missing all the things that we should have done that we don't do. So when any one of us wants to be pietistic, I always ask these questions here. Which one of us can honestly say that we indeed have been the absolute best husband or wife, son or daughter, employee or employer? Which one of us can say that we have been the absolute best Christian that we could possibly have been? Which one? There is none righteous. No, not one. Number two, the next New Testament word is parabasis. This word literally means to step across. There is a line drawn between that which is right and that which is wrong. There is a line between right and wrong. And every single one of us knows where that line is. 
because God has given every one of us a conscience. That little voice that warns us when we know we're about to do something wrong. And again, to quote Marty, I've quoted you this so many times now, that, uh, uh, that deep bass voice of Marty, we really do know better. We really, really do. And we do. Because there is a line between right and wrong. And our conscience tells us when we're about to step over that line. There's a line that divides honesty and dishonesty, truth and lies. Which one of us has never stepped to cross that line? And when we did, which one of us has excused stepping over the line with that phrase, well, preacher, maybe I did tell a little white lie. Euphemisms, a little white lie. Which one of us has never, ever, not even one time, by the spoken word or the silence or by twisting or evading or distorting the truth, which one of us, even a little bit, how many, I hope and pray none of you, but I hope you don't repost all those false conspiracy junk that's on the Facebook going around. There's a line, and that second word means that we step across that line. Deliberately, we know it. There is a line that divides kindness and courtesy from selfishness and harshness. For me, this is one of the things I've seen go so wrong in the world in which we live today. Common courtesy has been ditched. No common courtesy. On the news last night, a woman blinked her headlights to kind of get a, the oncoming car to dim his lights. The guy turned around and shot her. But you just, you, anywhere you go, you have to be careful what you say. So somebody will be in your face. No common decency, no common courtesy. Selfishness. Which one of us has never acted in a selfish manner? Which one of us? <laughs> There's the line that divides courtesy from selfishness and harshness. This is this line that we're talking about on this second word that means stepping across the line. I told you, most of you, that little story about James Dobson's granddaughter. Let me tell it one more time just in case you wasn't here. And forgive me, those of you who I've already told it to. Uh, James Dobson, I saw him on TV one day telling this story. He had the biggest smile on his face, but he had been preaching. I was watching him preach, and, and he had been talking about sin, and he used this word. And so to illustrate, he told about his granddaughter. He took her to a professional basketball game and they had seats up in the nosebleed area, you know, of the stands. And when halftime came, there's a whole bunch of kids ran down to the court, and, and they wanted to go out there and play on the court. And his granddaughter tugged on him, you know, Papa, Papa, can I go down and play with my friends down there? And James Dobson said, yes, you can go down. He said, I put my arm around her. And I said, now look, look here. You, you listen to Papa. He said, you see that line down there going around that co basketball court? Yes, sir, yes, sir. He said, you can go down there and play with your friends, but you cannot step across that line. Do you understand? Yes, sir. Because, you know, this is in the days when the floors made out of stuff we're not supposed to put our street shoes on. Y'all remember those kind of floors? See, y'all are old as I am. Y'all remember. Dobson says in his story, he said he turned a little girl loose, and boy, she was all happy. She flew down those steps, and can you see her? Can you hear her pounding those bleacher steps and she went down there you know and she bounced down there and got right down there with her friends and Dobson said she turned sideways like this that line is right here she looks up at her pawpaw like this with a great big smile on her face let me turn this way so you can see me and she's got this great big smile on her face and she goes <laughs> <laughs> deliberately showing her grandfather that she's going to step on that floor. She crossed the line 
And that's what this word in the Greek New Testament means, that we deliberately, we know where the line is, and we step across it knowing that we've stepped across it. Third word in New Testament, paratomna, paratomna. This word means slipping across the line. This crossing of the line is not so deliberate as paravasis. Uh, this is when a person slips like they might on an icy sidewalk or you spill some water in the kitchen floor and you slip on it. This kind of sin occurs when some impulse or passion temporarily overwhelms us and we lose our self-control and this temptation uh, over, gains control of us and sweeps us away. You ever been swept away in passion? Which one of us has never been caught off guard and swept away in passion or impulse? And I could illustrate it in a hundred different ways. Sometimes my wife comes home with something and I bemoan, you know, and put on my worst gr uh, grimace face and say, I thought I told you don't spend so much money. And she says, but it was right there by the cash register and it was so cute and I just... Impulse. Impulse. Why do you think they put it by the cash register? Yeah. So all of us have been impulse at times. Yeah. Alabama leads the nation in teenage pregnancies. Again. Does that give you an understanding of being swept away by passion or impulse? There is a thousand ways that all of us become guilty of this particular sin. Which one of you have never been caught off guard or lowered your guard and swept away by some impulse bind? Alcoholics have this sin. Shopaholics have this sin. Workaholics have this sin. A holic is a holic is a holic. Fourth word for sin is anomia. Anomia. This word literally means lawlessness. Lawlessness. Again, every human being on this earth does know the difference between right and wrong. But there's a lot of people who are lawless. They deliberately, they intend to, they want to, they break the law. I've given a couple examples here. Uh, teenagers who break into the school and deliberately destroy computers and desks and anything, break the mirrors in the bathrooms and spray paint the halls and all that stuff. They know it's wrong and they do it anyway. That's lawlessness. When I came across the... Um, roundabout close, closest to my house on the way over here very frequently on that roundabout I'll come to church Sunday morning and Saturday night some teenager has run his four wheel drive pickup truck on that roundabout and just tore it from one end to the other they planted plants there now I'm expecting to see them in the roundabout <laughs> slung out there one of these Sunday mornings that's lawlessness. Just knowing that it's wrong, but doing it anyway. Just because there is some innate thing in every human being that says, I don't care what anybody says, I'm going to do what I want to do. Right? That's the sin in the New Testament. <clears throat> that sin goes from that kid breaking into the school all the way to the mobs who see an opportunity to loot stores when there is a uh, thing going on. <clears throat> when a riot occurs. Some people boast that they've never broken one of the Ten Commandments, but which one of us can honestly say that we've never had a desire to break one of them? And according to Mr. Jesus, that desire is sin. And it's this sin of lawlessness. The last and the fifth word is ophilima. ophilima. 
This is the word used in the body of the Lord's prayer. This word means a debt. When we pray, forgive us our debts, we are being very literal. This is the word that's there. <clears throat> Which one of us can say that we have perfectly fulfilled our duty as a husband or a wife? That's what this word means, that we fail in some way, shape, or form in our duty to mankind. We fail in our duty to God. So which one of us, I ask again, has been the perfect husband or wife or son or daughter or employer or employee? Which one? Which one can say we have perfectly fulfilled our duty to God? No such person. Only Jesus Christ. So when we come to fully realize and understand what sin really is, we know there's a universal disease in every one of us. And I've quoted Barclay here on page 2. Outward respectability in the sight of man and inward sinfulness in the sight of God may well go hand in hand. This, in fact, is a petition of the Lord's Prayer, which every man needs to pray. Forgive us our debts. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. This line really says, I want you to pay attention to this part of the study tonight. This line literally says, forgive us our sins in proportion as we forgive those who have sinned against us. Now, I'm going to read this from the top of page 3 because I want it to sink in. I want you to read it with me. As I read it, you read it silently to yourself. Jesus states in the plainest language possible that if we, if, if we forgive those who have sinned against us, then God will forgive the sins we have committed. But if we refuse to forgive others, God will refuse to forgive us. It is, absolutely, it is abundantly clear, therefore, that if we pray this prayer with unforgiveness in our hearts toward others, we are asking God, not to forgive us. I really want that to sink in. If we deliberately, steadfastly refuse to forgive those who have sinned against us, we are quite deliberately asking God not to forgive us. Our forgiveness of our fellow man and God's forgiveness of us cannot be separated. They go hand in hand. I'm hammering on this because it is probably one of the biggest problems that we Christians have. <clears throat> How many times have you said or someone said to you, well, preacher, I'm going to forgive him, but I'm never going to forget it. Or see, if you don't forget it, you haven't forgiven it. And then I want to make sure I finish this with my time left. But but I want those words. I want you I want you to know these are the, the last two verses following the Lord's Prayer in the New Testament in the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus said, For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will forgive you too. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. I'm going, Brother Eric, I'm going to take off Friday, so make sure that I'm checking in with the chairman of the deacons. Matter of fact, I'm going to take off Friday and half a day Saturday. Uh, my, I'm on with my youngest son. I've talked him into taking me fishing Friday, and we're going up to the private lake in St. Stephen's, and we're going to fish Friday. I'm going to spend the night, Friday night, with my friend Warren Dees, and I'll spend Saturday morning in his place, and I'm going to deliberately do that because... My buddy Warren Dees is one of these people who, once he makes up his mind about something, you don't change it. I don't think God can change it. And so my buddy Warren Dees is carrying some very heavy unforgiveness in his heart toward members of his own family. And I, I have loved him and witnessed to him for many years. 
I told him that before I die, I wanted to baptize him in one of his ponds on this lake. He's afraid of water. He doesn't swim. I told him I'm going to take him to the deepest pond and dump him. But I can't do that until he confesses his sins and asks Christ to forgive him of his sins. And he can't be forgiven until he gets rid of that heavy load that he's carrying. And I, he knows I'm, I'm talking about him. I tell him I'm talking about him. And he, he says, I don't care. Talk to them. Tell them. They, and he'll always say, yeah, they need that sermon, preacher. You preach to them. He's a stubborn man. Stubborn. I literally had to beg him to go to his daughter's first wedding that I performed in the church in Salipta. He got angry with his daughter and told her he wasn't going to go to her wedding. He wasn't going to give her away. And I mean right up to five minutes before the ceremony was supposed to start, he held to it. <laughs> and I said, okay, we're going to start it without you, big boy. I'm going to tie this knot. And right at the five minutes before I was fixing to start the wedding ceremony, he came through the doors crying big old alligator tears. He never would forgive. I'm going to come because I know I'm supposed to, but I don't forgive you. <laughs> what kind of attitude is this? Anyway, I'm, I'm leisuring that. But my heart is heavy for my friend, and I want you to help me pray for him because I'm going to take this up there and leave it with him tomorrow morning when he has not had a drink and I want to go over it with him and I want him to understand that if he wants God to forgive him he's got to forgive because he believes the word of God anyway pray for my friend and pray for me please if we want to forgive we must understand these three things if we desire to have the kind of Christian forgiveness, this kind of Christian forgiveness in our lives. Number one, we must learn to understand other people. We must understand those who have sinned against us. I put a, fr a famous quote here that I repeatedly try to teach all of y'all. Everybody I come in contact with, I try to teach this to. Knowledge brings empathy. Knowledge brings empathy. If you have knowledge. I use the example. I'll use it again. <clears throat> again, y'all who have heard it, forgive me. It's a simple example. And that's why I use it. The man is laying by the swimming pool in his trunks, and he's taking a short nap out there by the swimming pool, and it's a nice, warm, hot day, and he's enjoying his time off, and he's taking a nap, and all of a sudden, water gets splashed on him from the swimming pool and it wakes him up and he gets angry and he says y'all stop that and he can't really see over in the pool because he's backed over here from it and, and, and but but that pool of water is just being thrashed and uh, you know kids are hollering and and and, and he y'all kids stop that i'm telling you right now stop it you're getting me wet i'm gonna come over and beat the tar out of all y'all you know so finally he gets mad and jumps up and he runs over to the swimming pool where he can see. And when he gets there, there's a child drowning in the pool and flailing in the water. And that's where all the splashing is coming from and the kid's about to drown. And all of a sudden, everything in his brain changes. And he jumps in the pool and rescues the kid. The other kids that were hollering were trying to get somebody's attention to save the kid. Knowledge brings empathy. If, if you think that there's just a bunch of rowdy kids just trying to tick you off, you can get mad about it. But on the other hand, if you see a drowning child, that changes everything, does it not? And for people who've sinned against you or for people who have not personally sinned against you, when you, when you see some of these kids 
you don't know what kind of home life they have. You don't know what they're coming from. You don't know what they live in every day. And when they're acting out, sometimes they're out to acting out trying to get attention. That's a hard lesson to learn. I took my kids from River Hill Baptist Church all night bowling. One of the oldest teenage girls had always, always been disrespectful, rowdy, getting in trouble, doing everything she shouldn't do. You know, got down to the bowling alley and she hooked up with a black boy and cussing. And I mean, just totally out of it. And I got so mad. <laughs> I got so angry. And we got back to that church. I had a Sunday school teacher go with me in my office with that young lady. And I was just reaming her out. And I said, and I, in her face, saying, why? You just tell me why you act like you do. You come from a good home. You got a good mom and daddy. What is wrong with you, girl? And that girl burst out in tears and anger and said, I come from a good home. You don't live in my home. You don't know that my daddy's been raping me since I was nine years old. What do you know, preacher man? Knowledge brings empathy, changes everything. If you want to love like Jesus loves, and if you want to forgive like Jesus forgives, you need to have knowledge because knowledge brings empathy. And, and remember, only God has all the knowledge. We only have a part. God knows everything. So maybe we should ask God to help us learn the people who've offended us. And maybe we should befriend them. And maybe we should have some empathy so that we can forgive them. We must also learn to forget. Preacher, I ain't never going to forget. I'm not going to forget. And here, I always remind you that you can do something God can't do. You can remember your sins. God says, I will remove your sins as far as the east is from the west, and I will remember them no more. I've illustrated that to you. Let me do it one more time. God says, I take your sins, like this watch is my sins. I take your sins, God says, in the Hebrew, and I put them behind my back, and no matter which way I turn, I can't see them. They're gone. I will remember them no more. And then over in the New Testament, he says it again. I will never leave you, I will never forsake you, and I will never, ever remember your sins. They're gone. Now, if God can do that, but we can't, so why why does God allow us one thing that we can do that God can't do? Why do we remember the sins? I think it's because hopefully we won't commit them again. If we know the hurt that they cause, if we know the harm that our sins cause, then hopefully that's an impetus to us not to continue those sins. So if we want to learn to forgive like Jesus is asking us to forgive in the Lord's Prayer, we need to learn to understand other people, we need to learn to forget, and we must learn to love. And the word is agape. It is not phileo. It, it is not storge. It is not eros. It is agape. God's love unconditional love. Do you know how difficult it is to love somebody unconditionally? Wow. <laughs> I think God blessed us grandmas and grandpas with a little, a little dose of that toward our grandchildren. So we must learn to understand, to forget, and to love. Forgive us our debts in the same proportion as we forgive those who are debtors. For if we forgive those who sin against us, God will forgive us. But if we refuse to forgive those who sin against us, God will refuse to forgive us. 
That's powerful. Powerful. Let's pray together. Father, sometimes I think it's impossible for me, but I know it's not. I'm making excuses. Lord, I just ask you for strength and courage to do what is right when I know what is right. I ask you, Lord, to increase your love in me so that I can love others. Make me a channel, oh God, of your love. Make every person in Union Baptist Church of God a channel of your love. Make us a channel of your understanding. Make us a channel of your forgiveness. For in this way, I know that we will bring your kingdom to earth as you have asked us to do. For we make our prayer in the name of him who asked us to do it. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. And amen. God bless you and keep you and cause the sun to rise upon you and give you peace.